Hi, my name is Radosław Dolinski and today I'm going to tell you a bit about Polish history. About heroes who came straight out of Poland, made it to the German-Soviet front and in the end of war, who liberated a Nazi concentration camp at Holyshov in Czech Republic. The famous Holy Cross Mountain Brigade, or in Polish, Brigada Świętokrzyska. And to truly understand the story, you need to hear a little bit about the National Armed Forces, which was an underground army unit that has been ruled by something called the Polish Organization, part of the Polish national movement. And in Poland, national doesn't mean necessarily nationalist. We have a Polish word, narodowy, narodowiec. So it's someone who serves his life for the duty of the country. Sometimes very comparable to the English word patriot. And to do this, we need to go back a little bit in time to the middle of the 1930s. The story of the modern Polish national movement starts with Roman Dmowski, one of the fathers of Polish independence in 1918 who did found an organization called the Camp of Big Poland, who was supposed to be not a political party, but more a social movement of activists who act for the Polish nation. After the rule of Józef Piłsudski, the Marshal of Poland, became authoritarian and political parties had lost most of their influence, young nationalists did start a movement called the National Radical Camp, which uh, was an organization called in Polish Obus Narodowo Radykalny, which was banned by the official gov government only three months after it was founded in 1934. In the next year, the underground nationalist movement were divided in two parts. One was becoming more radical and called Falanga. There was a major Nazi and fascist influence and a lot of anti-Semitic rhetoric. But the second part, which was composed of more elder activists in their 30s and 40s, that start an organization which historians call ONRABC. It was a movement of professionals, lawyers, engineers, professors, lots of people with academic background who were running an independent and secret organization, combining together people who would like to offer their lives and uh, activities for the well-being of the Polish nation. And from this organization, the ONR ABC, come all the people who will be involved in the creation of National Armed Forces and Holy Cross Mountains Brigade, especially Władysław Marcinkowski, nicknamed Jaksa, and Jerzy Iwakowicz nickname Olgierd. And that's why after the war broke out and Poland was invited on the 1st of September by the Germans and on 17th of September from the back by the Soviets, the Polish society started lots of underground movements. And all those nationalist organizations did also start their underground activities. And the main that was founded by the members of the 
so-called ONR ABC, which I mentioned before, they founded the Lizard Union. And it's good to understand where this name came from. Then we need to go back almost 500 years in time, where the north of Poland, so the coast of the Baltic Sea, is sized by the Teutonic Order. And Polish inhabitants of cities like Toruń or Gdańsk, they are founding an underground movement called the Lizard Union, which is like an underground resistance against the Teutonic Order. And in the moment of the war between Poland and the Teutonic Order, they do sabotage and reinforce the Polish uh, forces. And this genesis stands on the uh, back of this name, so the Lizard Union. Because we have again a situation where Poland has been conquered by some kind of Germans, at this moment the uh, Nazi regime of Hitler, and they are doing this national resistance. And the behavior of the Lizard Union will be totally different to the so-called Home Army, in Polish Armia Krajowa, because they will be running their activities in a far more conspirative way. Because they know that every action undertaken against the Germans, for example, killing a German soldier or officer, will cause the Germans for a brutal retaliation. And they might kill even like 100 anonymous Poles in a street massacre. That's why the Lizard Union is hiding most of their activities. And in parts of eastern Poland, where they are Soviet partisans, they can even claim that, they're, for example, they are attacking some Germans or uh, doing some sabotage in railways, has been done by Soviet partisans. Because they don't want Germans to harm the Polish people. But everything will change in the moment where Germans start to lose the war in 1942 and 43. Because firstly, all those nationalist underground organizations will come together and they're gonna create the so-called National Armed Forces in the year of 1942. And again, the next year, 1943, on the challenge of the Polish government in London, all the underground organizations are supposed to obey the orders of the Home Army. And the National Armed Forces starts the talks with the Home Army, which continue until spring 1944. But then, something happens that actually disturbs the stalls. Because the Home Army is not obeying the orders that have been given from London, and they want to start the so-called Action Storm. And this will lead to a break in many organizations, and the National Armed Forces will divide themselves, and only a part will obey the Home Army orders. The main reason for the division of the National Armed Forces after they have signed a union with the Home Army in March 1944 was the stance of the Home Army towards the Soviets. Because the Home Army have seen the Soviets as allies of our allies, which means the allies of the uh, British and American forces. The part of this organization that was coming out of the Lizard Union did leave the National Armed Forces and continue their fight against the Soviets which was very critical in the moment the Home Army started the Action Storm.
in the moment of liberation of pre-war Poland territories by the Soviet Red Army. So, in the Polish underground, in the beginning of 1944, we have the main plan of the so-called Action Storm, in Polish Akcja Burza, which means when the Soviets liberate a part of Poland, the Polish Home Army comes out of the underground, helps the Soviets to win against the Germans, and then come to the Soviets as allies and also the underground civil administration come to the, uh, supposed to come to the Soviet commandments and tell them that they are taking over the civil administration on the liberated part of the country. And this plan will fail. Because what do the Soviets? They betray their allies. They betray the Polish people because they have their own communist government which is being prepared in Moscow by Stalin and his compatriots to take over Poland and make it a Soviet Republic or a country dependent to the Soviets. That's why in all the areas where the Home Army comes out of the underground after the Germans are gone, the Soviets size them, they bring them to surrender their weapons. All the officers are being taken by the Soviet secret police, the NKVD, and brought to prisons and so-called lagers in Russian Wagre, in Siberia or the eastern part of Russia. And all those regular soldiers are being forced to join the Polish army that is being run by the communists, the so-called army of General Berling. And that's why the Polish underground is gone. But there are also the smart guys from the national armed forces who don't surrender and who start not only to fight the Germans, but also oppose the Soviets. And some of them will continue the fight even up until the early 1950s. But they have also a separate plan. Because the civil commandment of the National Armed Forces, which didn't join the Home Army, they want to create three big army units. One of them is uh, being planned to be the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade. And they want them to move west after the retreating German army and size this what is now, nowadays, the part of Western Poland that has been under German rule before the Second World War. So they want to claim those lands for Poland, that Poland comes out of the war as a victor, with new territories. But this plan is uh, impossible to come to life, to be realized, because the Germans are retreating in an organized way, and with the Soviets following them close by. Which means that there is no space for any Polish units to really move and size any territory. And that's why, in the summer of uh, 1944, the civil commandment of the National Armed Forces creates the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade in the area of the Holy Cross Mountains, which is called in Polish Góry Świętokrzyskie. And all those elite units of National Armed Forces partisans are supposed to join them and create a real fighting force. And some of the already existing legends of the Polish undergrounds will join this brigade. The partisan units that have formed 
the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade were mostly fighting Germans in woods and countryside for more than one year. Many of them were led by pre-war officers of the Polish army and those soldiers who fought in the war against Germans and Soviets in September 1939 and never gave up. And after the fall of Poland continued the fight in underground. The most famous of them were Zbik, which can be translated as Wildcat. His real name was Władysław Kołaczyński. He was very active in the region, region of uh, Częstochowa, where he even did a famous bank robbery against the German occupation forces. Another hero was Leonard Zub Zdanowicz, a pre-war officer who did not surrender to the Soviets, which did save him la his life, because his other colleagues that, that surrendered in the end of September 1939 were killed by the Soviets in the massacre of Katyn in the spring of 1940. But Zub Zdanowicz went to France, where he joined the Polish forces in the West and did fight against the German occupation of Norway in the famous Battle of Narvik on the side of the British forces. After the fall of France, he joined the Polish army in Great Britain, where he was trained as a paratrooper and sent to Poland to fight in the underground. Another great soldier was Step, Henryk Figuro Podhorski, who was famous for his horse riding skills and often did attack Germans together with his soldiers on horseback. And another great hero was the commander of the brigade, Colonel Bochun, Antoni Szacki. A soldier all his life, who as a teenager did fight for Polish independence in the war against Soviet Russia, 1990 and 1920. After the war, he did finish a military university and become a professional soldier. He was fighting against Germans in September of 1939. Taking captive, he fled and started to act as an underground activist for the Lizard Union. Later on, he became the chief officer of the National Armed Forces in the area of Kielce. He was one of the most and best experienced officers commanding a partisan unit on the in the territory of Poland. On 1st of August 1944, the Warsaw Rising starts. The whole army starts the fight to liberate Warsaw from the German forces. And it will be a 63 days of hard struggle and fight against Germans, in which almost 200,000 Polish people will be killed and most of the city destroyed. And the National Armed Forces, which actually oppose the Warsaw Rising as a part of the uh, action storm, they, who are in Warsaw, will join the fights. And uh, one of the most brave units, the so-called Chrobry II, 
will mostly be composed of soldiers of the national armed forces. But that also means that all the civil commandments of the national armed forces are in Warsaw and they don't have much contact with the rest of the country. Because Warsaw is, based, is like a form of siege of the German forces. And that's when the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade will start to operate independent. And in the whole of fall 1944, they will be fighting firstly against the Germans, and there are going to be lots of major battles, like the Battle of Sasov, where they defeat a whole column of German motorized vehicles. But they also gonna defend the Polish population of this region against the Soviets, against Soviet and communist partisans who act like bandits because they attack Polish villages. They stole all the food in really hard times and also all the property of the Polish people that live there. And then gonna come to a very deciding moment the so-called fight at Zemiec, or on Polish, Akcja pod Rządcem, where the national armed forces gonna destroy a big unit of the communist partisans and Soviet paratroopers in a bitter fight. The action at Zsombets, sometimes called also the Battle of Zsombets, is a great of example of how did communist partisans and Soviet paratroopers behave on the Polish lands occupied by Germans. There was a force of 300 communist strong, which was well known for the acts of banditism and violent crimes against civilians. Local, local villagers have asked the brigade, Brigada Świętokrzyska, for an intervention. And they did attack. And in a battle that lasted for more than one hour, they won and have taken into captivity most of the Soviet partisans. Unfortunately, the, their leader, Tadeusz Grochal, called Tadek the White, escaped. After the war, he became a colonel of the Polish communist army and one of the heroes of the socialism in Poland. After the battle, in the night, most of the Soviet paratroopers tried to escape from the captivity. A fight did start and most of them were shot by the soldiers of the brigade. It was a sad situation but definitely not a war crime. But after the war, the communist regime built a monument on the site of fighting, on which stood that bandits from the National Armed Forces killed at this place 74 heroes from the Red Army and communist partisans. And this monument stood there until 2018, when it was finally removed by the local authorities. And after the fight at Zsombiec, the National Armed Forces, and especially the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade, will become a victim of a hardline Soviet and communist propaganda, which will continue until 1989. And in some leftist circle, also until nowadays. They're gonna be called the bandits of NSZ. The Soviet propaganda will declare them fascist because they're gonna write in newspapers and tell on the radio that together with the Germans, the nationalist fascist bandits from the national armed forces did kill Soviet soldiers. And in the early years of Stalinism in Poland, in the second half of the 40s and beginning of the 50s, they will be 
the enemy number one of the communist state. And even later on, former soldiers of the National Armed Forces will be discriminated and uh, actually in an economical way hunted by the communist regime in Poland. So already then, in the end of 1944, their civil commandment of the National Armed Forces sees that the only way to rescue those young, brave people from death by Soviets and Communists is to break away, go to the West and join the Polish army, the Polish forces, which fights on the side of the West Allies, especially the Polish army of General Anders, who fights Germans in Italy as part of the uh, British and American forces. And very similar things happen then with the main underground force, so the Home Army. Because already beginning of January, the last leader of the Polish Home Army will give an order that they should stop active fighting against the Germans, go more deeper into conspiration, and mostly only defend the Polish population, the Polish people. And on the 19th of January, the Polish Home Army will be disbanded. Because the leader, General Kolitsky, sees that the Soviets were going to crush them. And in the meantime, the National Armed Forces, their civil commandment, gives the order to move west. But unfortunately, on the 14th of January, the Soviets start the so-called Winter Spring Offensive of 1945. And within a couple of days, we're going to seize most of the pre-war Polish territory. And the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade find themselves in something like a sack between Germans and Soviets. The main winter spring offensive of the Soviet Red Army started on the 12th of January 1945. The outcome would be the great Soviet win against Germany and the capture of Berlin in the end of April 1945. On the next day in the morning hours, the general commander of the National Armed Forces, nicknamed Bogutsky, sent a short message to the commander of the brigade. The Soviet offensive launched. The brigade should move west. We can't deliver any help. You need to count on yourself. And in the next two days, the brigade tried to break through the German lines, unfortunately without success. On the 15th of January, they reached a bridge on the river Gliza, and on the same day, they have been attacked by the Soviets. Fortunately, they were able to escape. On the next day, in a gamble, out of desperation, Colonel Bochum met the local German commander of the defense of the bridge. And after the talks, he issued an order to his brigade. The Soviet offensive made us to move west of Poland. For the last two days, we fought Germans trying to break through their lines west. And we didn't succeed. Yesterday, we have been attacked by Soviet tanks. To rescue our brigade, I talked with the local German commandment who allowed us to pass the bridge and move west. This meant we went into a state of no fighting against Germans for a certain period. I hope that the fast moving forward 
circumstances of the wartime will allow us to reach contact with the general commander of the Polish armed forces in the West and that following their orders we're gonna attack our enemies. And that was the beginning of the famous march to the West of the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade. And this is where the black legend of the Holy Cross Mountain campaign that was published by the communist starts because they are being accused of cooperating with Germans yet it was impossible that without a formal agreement without a cooperation with the uh, Nazis they were able to cross the front and move on and not being uh, taken by the, by the Soviets but there are two things we need to realize first one is that uh, after the start of this major Soviet offensive, winter spring 1945, it's not only the Germans who retreat. Together with the Germans, there are lots of other units and uh, nations who do retreat west. All those who fear the Soviets are trying to flee to Western Europe. And some historians assume there was almost one and a half million people, which uh, a big movement which was uh, composed of uh, the so-called Vlasov army, so Russians who did fight on the German side in the Second World War. All those uh, military units that were uh, supporting Germans from uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, many uh, people from White Russia, who because they were uh, part of the so-called uh, uh, civil police that was maintained by the German, are fear that the Soviets gonna treat them as traitors. And they flee with their families, sometimes with whole villages. So it's like a big movement of people who declare themselves as anti-communist and are afraid of Soviets. Unfortunately for them, after the end of the Second World War, most of them, of them will be handed as traitors back to the Soviets and will end up in uh, Soviet prisons and those uh, cruel uh, labor camps in far Siberia. Most of them will also uh, die in the 40s or 50s. And in this big movement of people, the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade, well, it's a force 800 people strong, but still for like the regular German army, for Wehrmacht officers, they are being seen as uh, another group of anti-communists who try to fly, flee away from the Soviets. And on the 16th of January, when the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade get on the river Pilica, they are like in a stalemate, because before them are the Germans and on the back the Soviets are approaching with their tanks. And Bochum, Colonel, Colonel Bochum, the leader of the brigade, starts talks with German. And he declares that uh, he wants to pass, he will not fight the Germans, he won't also support them, but if they don't clear the passage, he will fight them. And they get a paper from a German officer which allows them to pass. And in the next weeks they will use this paper to move across German units without fighting. They are mostly only small skirmishes. And in this time also uh, something very interesting will happen because uh, it's already February. They will be approaching a town called uh, now, nowadays Wałbrzych. Uh, previously, it was the German Waldenberg uh, in the region called uh, Lower Silesia. And while they are trespassing, they see a group of prisoners of war from the Warsaw Rising, so Polish uh, soldiers, who are being led by Germans to a, a labor camp in the West. Well, the regular soldiers want to attack and free their colleagues. 
but of course the uh, officers of the brigade uh, cannot attack the Germans because uh, soon the news will be spread and the German army would attack them. But they do it very sneak and smart. Uh, they go across the prisoner column and every moment the Germans don't look, some of the Polish prisoners of war are jumping over and in the smart way, more than 100 Polish prisoners of war are being saved by the brigade. Then uh, there are some talks with uh, higher uh, officers of Wehrmacht, which contact Berlin, and they gain again a declaration from the Germans that they can uh, trespass, and also uh, information that uh, they should, uh, in which region they should follow. But then something very unusual will happen. Because on the 20th of February, a guy called Tom, this is his nickname, the name he uses is uh, Herbert Jura, will meet the brigade. And some officers of the brigade, like uh, uh, Jaksa Marcinkowski, know him because he was cooperating with the intelligence of the National Armed Forces in Poland. What we now know about Jura is that he was also an agent of the Gestapo. But on the other hand, he was also an agent of the British Secret Service. It was a very secret person and very mysterious. Till nowadays we have only one picture of him and we don't know much about this person. But he will start getting involved with the brigade and this will change the destiny of the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade. Hubert Jura, known also as Herbert Jung or Herbert Jura, was a very mysterious person. What we know is that he was born in a mixed Polish-German family. Probably before the war he was an officer of the Polish army, probably working as a double agent for the German intelligence, Polish intelligence and maybe even for the British Secret Service. During the war he was active with the home army leading a partisan unit in the area near the town called Radom. At that time he was also enlisted as a secret agent of the Gestapo, the German secret police, working with Hauptsturmführer Paul Fuchs. In 1944 he got involved with the secret service of the National Armed Forces, all the time working together with Gestapo. On the 20th of February he approached the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade, the Świętokrzyska Brigade, together with some German officials, including Paul Fuchs. He did propose to the brigade to enter an alliance with Germany, something he called the All-European Anti-Communist Front, which was supposed to join the Allies in a future war against Soviet Union. The officers of the brigade didn't sign any pact or official documents on the stocks, but thanks to the involvement of uh, Hubert Jura, of the secret Tom, they got an allowance from the Wehrmacht to move to the Czech Republic to the direction of Prague. And also in the following weeks, through Tom and his compliances, the brigade was served with food and munition from the resources of the Wehrmacht. After these negotiations that were uh, possible uh, thanks to Herbert Jura, the famous and mysterious Tom, the Germans gonna decide to intern the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade in the territory of Moravia in Czech Republic. And the Polish soldiers are gonna walk to this village where are all barracks of the Czech army. 
and it's gonna look like they are like interned in those barracks. They still have their weapons, they can practice, uh, but they are surrounded by Germans. And Germans have more and more requests to the brigade. First, they request that uh, some part of the brigade will uh, mm, help the Germans, will be trained as paratroopers and sent over the front line, the occupied already by the Soviets Poland, to uh, help the Germans with uh, information and act of sabotage. And uh, Colonel Bochum, the leader of the brigade, is forced to accept this request. But he asked his soldiers to go as volunteers. And uh, some volunteers will come, there will be close to 60 soldiers and one woman, a lady with the nickname Grażyna. And uh, the Germans will train them as paratroopers and send two groups over to Poland and one group will sneak across the front line, also on the Polish uh, mm, territory. But what's most important is what's going to happen with them. Because there is a secret order given by Bochum that after they get out of the control of the Germans and land in Poland, they don't obey any, on any orders of the Germans. If they are accompanied, accompanied by any German soldier or officer, they are supposed to kill him or them after landing and join again the underground forces of the National Armed Forces. So look for the next commandment and uh, join his unit. And this is going to ha happen. The leader of the first group that uh, landed in Poland, Zygmunt Rafalski, nicknamed Sulimczyk, was uh, taken as a prisoner by the uh, Soviets. Then uh, he fled, but was uh, imprisoned again by the Polish communists. And in 1950 was his trial, and he was sentenced to death. But even on this trial, he didn't admit that he did cooperate with German, that he didn't fight on the German side, and he only used uh, them to help uh, his uh, main unit, so the uh, Holy Cross Mountains Brigade. He will be sentenced to death, but uh, thanks to the help of a famous poet, Julian Tuvin, he will be, uh, then his death sentence will be uh, declared lifelong prison and he will survive. And then when uh, Free Poland comes again in the 1990s, a Polish court will dismiss his sentence. And the Polish court will de officially declare that he didn't collaborate with the Germans. He only used the help of the Germans to uh, follow his orders that was given by his Polish commandment. And he never did help or support the German war effort. In some way, those soldiers who volunteered for this uh, German action for Poland did sacrifice them for the good of the brigade. The brigade who have tried in most of uh, March to get contact with the Czech resistance, with the Czech underground movement. And this happened in the beginning of April. And thanks to the help of the Czech partisans, the brigade could organize their great flee from this German internment camp on the 13th of April 1945. Before the brigade left the camp at Rostani, it has been reinforced with many Polish prisoners coming from uh, the, the German prisoner camps in Czech Republic. Also, in a gesture of goodwill, the Germans released from a concentration camp Cecilia Mikołajczyk, the wife of former Prime Minister of Polish government in London. And Cecilia left, stayed with the brigade until May 1945. When the brigade left Rostani, they were heading for Pilsen because they got the information from the Czech resistance that just before 
the entrance of the US Army, an uprising at Pilsen will be launched. But in the end of April, when they were quite close to the city, they got the information that the plans for an uh, uprising has been cancelled. And then on the 29th of April, they decided to end the non-fighting with the Germans. And on the 29th of April, one of the soldiers of the brigade wrote in his memoir, we are taking Germans captive. We take their uniforms, weapons and food. After the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade gets the message from the Czech resistance that they withdraw from the idea of an uprising in Pilsno, the brigade decides to fight against the Germans on their own without the Czech resistance. And on the 30th of April, they start the, the fight. They are fighting Germans, they are taking over villages, taking uh, German soldiers as prisoners. And in the same time, the two days after, they get into radio contact with the US Army. They declare themselves as allies, as part of the Polish forces. And they start to coordinate next moves with the US Army. And on the 5th of May, 1945, the most glorious act of the brigade will happen. Because on this day, the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade will liberate the, camp, the Nazi concentration camp in the village of Holyshev in Czech Republic. This is a camp for women, where is more than 1,000 prisoners and 200 of them are Jewish women from France, Poland, Hungary, Italy, mostly. The brigade uh, is doing some espionage and they attack in the moment where the uh, SS has their lunch. The fight is rapid and after the fight they see that all the Jewish women, which is the, there were 280 of them, were gathered in two buildings. Beside those buildings, there is already preparated fuel. The SS, who were at the time of the attack of the brigade having lunch, were planning to put those building, buildings on fire straight after lunch and burn alive 280 Jewish women, which whose lives had been saved by the soldiers of the brigade. On, this, on the same day, they also liberate a labor camp in which uh, the Germans have more than 10,000 uh, prisoners, mostly from Czech and Poland. And in two days, on the 7th of May, they meet the US Army, who is approaching uh, this region of uh, the Czech Republic. And thanks God, it's the army of General Patton, who is not only anti-communist, but who is also aware of the history and the relations in Middle and Eastern Europe, and who knows that the real enemy of the Polish people are not only the Germans, but also the Soviets. It's also a funny coincidence, because uh, one of the officers of the brigade, Jerzy Iwakowicz, Nicknamed Olgert, Olgert uh, meets, we can say, colleague. It's Anthony Biddle, uh, officer of the U.S. Army, uh, who uh, has been a friend of the family uh, in the thirties, where uh, he, when he was uh, as a businessman active in Poland. And thanks also to his influence on General Patton. Uh, the brigade is not being taken as prisoner, but the US Army intelligence starts an official investigation to which ends very positively, very good for the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade. After two days of investigation performed by the US Army Intelligence Service, the Holy Cross Mountains Brigade has been acknowledged 
as an allied force and officially taken into account by the US Army, by the 2nd Infantry Division from the Army commanded by General Patton. The soldiers of the brigade got American equipment, food, cars and on the 8th of May they could celebrate with everyone the end of the Second World War. One week later, an officer from the Polish Armed Forces, General Anders from Italy, came to visit the brigade. And the brave soldiers could hope that soon they're gonna join Polish Armed Forces in Western Europe. And the main reason that the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade was acknowledged as part of the Allies was thanks to the personal involvement of General Patton, who had a clear vision that the next opponent of the US are the Soviets. And sooner or later, there gonna be a war between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union, which finally emerged as the Cold War and Hot War in some regions all over the world from, 19, uh, from the late 1940s until 1989. What did happen is the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade was the only unit of the Polish forces who was allowed to uh, wear the signs of the uh, US Army. And first, General Patton gave them a small region of uh, the Czech Republic uh, the Czech uh, land, where they were supposed to uh, act as uh, an occupying force and uh, help, helping to establish uh, uh, the new uh, Czech administration together with the uh, US Army War Administration. And uh, the news of this reached the Polish government in London. And first it was like a big hip hip, hip hooray because we have a Polish partisan unit that made it straight out of Poland through the German lines and get into contact with the US Army. Um, but then when they heard these are the National Armed Forces, so those rebe re rebels that didn't uh, obey the orders of the Home Army, uh, their enthusiasm fell down. And even General Anders, the uh, commander of the uh, Polish forces uh, in Italy, um, didn't accept the uh, kind request of uh, Colonel Bochum to accept the brigade as part of the Polish armed forces uh, in the West. Uh, what happened, of course, he sent some officers to the, br to the brigade. They took with uh, them the uh, wife of uh, former uh, prime minister of the Polish government in Poland, Stanisław Mikołajczyk, because she was liberated by the brigade in the uh, Czech Republic. Uh, they also started some operational contacts uh, and also two funny things did happen. Uh, first is uh, many politicians and uh, soldiers from uh, different European countries uh, whose citizens were the uh, women liberated at the concentration camp at Holyshov were coming to the brigade, there were ma many cheers, many celebrations. Uh, also the British Secret, Ser Secret Service came and they took with them this mysterious stone, Herbert Ura. So this is another proof that uh, he was probably a British uh, secret agent. Uh, what we know about his uh, later um, life is that uh, he was active with the British service in many countries around the world. Uh, his final trace disappeared in the 90s in Argentina, but still we don't know um, if he died if he died and when and where, and the only photo we have from him is uh, the one from the uh, war times. And also Polish historians asked many times uh, the British government to uh, release some documents about this mysterious figure, about uh, Tom Herbert Ura, but till now it did not happen. But then the relationship between uh, the brigade and the Allies, the Western Allies, was losing. First, 
there were very hard requests from the Soviets, from Stalin himself, to hand over the brigade as German collaborants. This was refused by the administration of President Truman, thanks to the personal involvement of General Patton, who did save the brigade for the second time. And then the Soviets started the provocation. A guy claiming himself as Stanisław Lityński, a Polish junior journalist from London, came to the brigade. That brigade, uh, the officers of the brigade did accept him, they, he did some interviews, uh, made some pictures, and then he returned to London and did publish, uh, published an infamous press release called Polish Fascist Reign Five Villages in Czech Republic. And it was a major scandal in London and also in uh, Western Europe. What we know now, this guy was called Stefan Litauer. He was really a Polish journalist, was active from the, for the Polish government in London, but was released from his duties in 1944 because the Polish intelligence did, disco did discover that he was a secret agent of the Soviets. And this was a major provocation uh, that forced the Americans to move the brigade to Germany. And they arrived in Karlsfeld in August 1945. The US administration wanted to disband the brigade, but they were saved once again by General Patton. Because of the tension with the Soviets, also the Czech administration, and the bad publicity made by the false pro press articles by the Soviet agent Litauer, the brigade has been moved to Germany, first to Coburg and then Karlsfeld. The soldiers had to leave their weapons and first work in German factories. But then, thanks to the intervention of General Patton, they have been hired by the Third American Army as some kind of military police. They have been helping the US Army to find German officers, members of the SS and the Nazi party, NSDAP, and of course also providing normal police protection for the area they have been responsible for. It is a pity that a Soviet provocation enabled the brigade to join the Polish armed forces in the West. The soldiers of the now disbanded Holy Cross Mountain Brigade did not only act as uh, this, this uh, kind of military police in Germany, some of them also started to uh, cooperate with the American intelligence service. They created a special way, it was called uh, the way of Konrad, of bringing people from the Western Europe as secret agents and emissaries to the uh, communist Poland, occupied by the Soviets, using uh, their contacts with the soldiers of uh, national armed forces who were left at Poland who are still running the underground fight against the communist regime. And uh, this uh, communication channel was also used by General Anders, who via this way of Con this Konrad way sent to Poland his first emissary, also a very well-known hero of Polish modern history, Rotmistrz Witold Pilecki. But the Soviets never gave up their hand on the soldiers of the brigade. In 1946, they 
started another provocation and uh, a prosecutor of the Polish Communist Army, his name was uh, Moshe Muscat, you can find him as uh, Marian Muscat or Max Muscat in the Wikipedia, um, has charged the four main officers of the brigade, so the leader, Colonel Bochum, Antoni Szatski, but also uh, Major, then Colonel, Colonel uh, Władysław Marcinkowski Jaksa, Leonard Zubzdanowicz, and Jerzy Iwakowicz, I know these are very hard Polish names to pronounce, as war criminals. And they have been uh, charged with the uh, charges of uh, war crimes to an international uh, court, a tribunal for war crimes in London. So, they were registered as war criminals. Uh, they had to be interned by the US Army in Germany. But, thanks God, in normal civilized world, when you put charges against someone, you need to deliver some proofs. And the communists in Poland started uh, almost a three-month preparation to prepare those proofs documents, statements, uh, interviews with wit witnesses of the war crimes against the Polish nation and collaboration with Germans. Uh, I've heard there were like tons of documents prepared. But when this uh, communist prosecutor, this Moshe Mushkat, saw those files, he withdrew the charges. It was such a bullshit that no independent court no independent tribunal or judges could accept them as proofs of war crimes. But as time has uh, shown, uh, this hunt for the soldiers of the brigade did not stop. In the next years, most of them moved to France uh, because they started a cooperation with uh, French intelligence services and uh, also, uh, many of the soldiers were still uh, working together as labor groups uh, in uh, French factories. And then, in 1950, the Soviets started again an action, this time against the colonel Antoni Szatsky Bochum. They put on official charges of war crimes against Jews, killing of Jews in occupied Poland, and also collaboration with the uh, Nazis. And the French authorities uh, have arrested Bochum and put him on a trial in July 1950. And while standing on the trial, Colonel Bochum not only defended himself, but also gave a good lesson of modern history French judges. Po klęsce armii niemieckiej pod Stalingradem, w miarę zbliżania się Armii Czerwonej do przedwojennej granicy Polski, partia komunistyczna PPR, Polska Partia Robotnicza, rozpoczęła organizować oddziały leśne pod nazwami Armii Ludowej i Polskiej Armii Ludowej. Nieliczne te oddziały komunistyczne swoją prowokacyjną działalnością sprowadzały duże represje niemieckie na ludność polską zamieszkała w małych miasteczkach i wsiach. Niemcy za zabicie ich jednego żołnierza palili nieraz całe osiedla wraz z ludnością, rzucają do ognia małe dzieci. Armia Ludowa i sowieckie oddziały partyzanski miały również za zadanie przygotować listy imienne niewygodnych dla przyszłego rządu komunistycznego Polaków oraz zwalczanie Armii Krajowej i Narodowych Sił Zbrojnych. Armia Sowiecka po zajęciu Wilna, Lwowa i Lublina po wykorzystaniu pomocy oddziałów licznych Armii Krajowej po zdobyciu tych miast podstępnie je rozbrajała, oficerów przeważnie rozstrzeliwała, a żołnierzy wysyłała w głąb Rosji. 
gdy 1 sierpnia 1944 roku wybuchło powstanie warszawskie, rząd sowiecki wstrzymał ofensywy swoich wojsk i przyglądał się z przedmieścia Warszawy, jak stolica Polski w ciągu 63 dni bohaterskich walk krawiła się, ponosząc olbrzymie straty w ludziach. Sowiety nie udzieliły pomocy. Warszawa została kompletnie zniszczona przez Niemców. Po tych wszystkich doświadczeniach Armii Krajowej otrzymałem rozkaz od dwóch Narodowych Sił Zbrojnych generała Bogockiego nakazujący w razie ruszenia ofensywy sowieckiej wycofać Brygadę Świętokrzyską na zachód i starać się dotrzeć do drugiego polskiego korpusu dowodzonego po stronie aliantów zachodnich przez generała Anders. Rozkaz wykonałem 6 maja 1945 roku połączyłem się z III Armią Amerykańską generała Patona. Na tylach 13 Armii Niemieckiej dnia 4 maja 1945 roku uwolniliśmy obóz koncentracyjny w Oliszowie Czechy. Tysiąc kobiet różnych narodowości, w tym 180 Francuzek, 200 Polek i około 280 pochodzenia żydowskiego i innych. Wysłaniem Brygady Świętokrzyskiej na zachód daliśmy dowód niegodzenia się z zaistnianym stanem w Polsce. Byliśmy głosem narodu polskiego na siebie, którego została dokonana oczywista zbrodnia, której nawet nie wstrzymał fakt, że Polacy dali ogromny wkład w II wojnie światowej w walce o ideały wolności i sprawiedliwości na świecie. Wierzę, że Wysoki Sąd Francuski Weźmy pod uwagę fakty podane przeze mnie i wyda wyrok uwolnienia mnie. Moją jedyną winą jest to, że urodziłem się Polakiem, kocham swój kraj i walczyłem w II wojnie światowej o wolność i niepodległość mojej ojczyzny i gotów jestem jako oficer Polski walczyć z każdym, kto znajdzie się na ziemiach polskich bez zgody narodu polskiego. Of course, on the trial in Toulouse, Colonel Bochum, Antoni Szacki, was cleared of all the charges. A very big help were statements from the French women of Jewish origin who were liberated by the brigade in uh, Holyshoek in Czech Republic. Because a couple of them came to the trial and gave their statement, what they witnessed, what they saw, and how did the soldiers of the brigade behave towards them, and how they fought against Germans. But still, the Soviets were still hunting for Bochum. And in the 50s, while he was still living in France, there were two assassination attempts prepared by the Soviet and uh, Polish communist intelligence. Thanks to God, he did survive, but in 1955, he had to flee to the United States. There are also many other soldiers and officers of the brigade went. They were well-educated people, many of them already with uh, university education, many did uh, finish a college in the US, UK, also many of them moved to New Zealand or Australia, they become successful. They did open businesses. Uh, they were also active in the uh, Polish community. Many Polish cultural institutions in the uh, US or UK was, was, were also co-founded by previous soldier of, uh, former soldier of the uh, Holy Cross Mountain Brigade. But it was a big pity for Poland that uh, they couldn't help to rebuild the country after the war. Because all of them who tried to return to Poland in the 40s or 50s, they were hunted, then uh, imprisoned and sentenced to, by the communist regime. Many of them were sentenced to death and only uh, the involvement of the famous poet, famous Polish poet of Jewish origin, Julian Tuwin, help get them lifelong sentences instead of the death penalty. 
Uh, the involvement of Tuvin was because of uh, his close friend, also a portress, uh, Kazimiera Iwakiewicz, which was uh, a relative of the officer of the brigade, Jerzy Iwakowicz, whom I did mention before. And nowadays, it's really important that we regain the real history of the brigade, that we share the right message. And let me be crystal clear, the communist regime made everything to show them as war criminals to the West. There were tons of publications, tons of books and information that was also shared with Western historians about the fact that, well, about the myth, which was untrue, that the national armed forces were anti-Semites, that they were war criminals. And this still continues. Even nowadays, when, for example, the Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki or the President Duda is doing anything to acknowledge the achievements of the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade, there is a big attack from many communist media and left-oriented newspapers, like Gazeta Wyborcza, who declare them war criminals and fascists. And if you are interested in Polish history, please remember that Wikipedia might not be the best source of information. Because even in the Wikipedia article on uh, the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade, you will find many false information, which, uh, of course, Polish historian challenge, but sometimes it uh, takes some time and it's a quite long process. But for me, as a um, Pole, what is mostly important to understand that the Holy Cross Mountain Brigade, they were victorious. They've made it to the West. They did survive. They didn't end up in Soviet prisons, like many of their brothers in arms who were left behind or stayed in Poland. And they also brought to the West the message that Polish people were not aligned with the Soviets. We were not real allies of the Soviets and we didn't want the communist regime that was installed by the Soviets in Poland after World War II. And if you like to get more information on Polish history, please subscribe the channel. We came to the end. Uh, in the following weeks, I will record a couple more videos uh, about Polish history, especially the modern history uh, from the World War II and after the World War II until the fall of the communism. Uh, if you have a subject that is of a big interest for you, please leave a comment under the video. And I hope in the end that all the mistakes that I have made uh, are only uh, because of my uh, language skills and not uh, false information. <laughs> Thank you and goodbye. Yeah.